Is vaping really as bad as people say it is? Now let's turn our attention to vapes. A new research is shedding light on the health risks of e-cigarettes. 9% of 11 to 15 year olds use e-cigarettes up from 6% in 2018. The United States is banning the sale of all products by Juul. Are they demonizing this because it's actually bad? Or are they demonizing this because it's a threat to profits for an established company that has a shit ton of money? There are a lot of misconceptions about vaping and governments around the world have differing opinions. Norway, India and 30 other countries have banned vaping altogether, while Australia is taking a totally unique approach. Meanwhile, the UK and US governments are pushing vapes as a method of stopping smoking. So everyone wants to know, is vaping really as bad as people say it is? Well, I've been speaking to one of the world's leading experts on vapes, who co-authored the research that influenced Australia's unique approach to vape regulation. And this research has changed my view on vapes in a major way. For those that don't know me, I'm a medical doctor in the UK and I get asked about vaping all the time by patients, family and friends. And before researching this video, I didn't have a good answer as the latest information on vaping is in medical journals and is perhaps not as accessible as it should be. So that's what I'm gonna give you today, the new stuff. So a vape, an e-cigarette, electronic cigarette, these are all one of the same things. This is our expert, Amelia. And these are usually battery powered devices that airlie the liquid for a user to then inhale. They have been in the market uh, for a while now, but the products that were around in 2003 don't look anything like the products that we have today. They're bright, they're colorful, there's thousands of different flavors out there various nicotine concentrations as well. So uh, there's quite an array of products available for people. Along with the team at the Centre for Public Health Data and Policy at the Australian University, Amelia published some really impactful papers in 2023. The first being a systematic review of the health effects or health outcomes of vapes. At Fergoscopy, we like good quality evidence and systematic reviews are at the top of the pyramid of evidence because they're based on comprehensive searches of related studies from all over the world. And in this case, they used 400 studies in their evidence synthesis. And what did they find out? They looked at 20 health outcomes and we're gonna talk about the big ones. We have conclusive evidence about Ivali. So that is the e-cigarette and vaping associated lung injury. So that's quite well established uh, that e-cigarettes can cause that damage. An Ivali outbreak started in the US in July 2019 and 2,807 people were hospitalized in the following six months. 68 of them died. The symptoms were non-specific. Like a lot of lung diseases, with damage to your alveoli leading to low oxygen, patients were presenting with symptoms like shortness of breath, cough, fevers, which meant that you could only diagnose Ivali once you'd ruled out all other causes. So basically, Ivali is lung damage that can't be accounted for by anything other than vapes. And this is also new that we haven't actually figured out exactly how the vapes damage the lung tissue. And with the amount of e-liquids and vape devices out there, there's many different ways that vaping can damage the lungs. In these patients, they tested the e-liquids and took samples from their lungs with bronchoalveolar lavage to try and figure out the chemical causing Ivali. Most patients had THC or vitamin E acetate in their lungs, which led doctors to think that it was these things that were causing Ivali. Vitamin E acetate was banned, but Ivali cases didn't disappear. You might think it's THC then, but in fact, 14% of Ivali cases didn't have THC or vitamin E acetate in them at all. And outside of the US, where THC is uncommon or mostly illegal, Ivali cases still exist, which means Ivali must also be caused by chemicals that we haven't figured out yet. But Ivali is far from the only health effect of vaping. Seizures are being caused by the hyper-effective nicotine delivery system that we see in modern vapes that is causing people to hit unprecedented toxic levels of nicotine, way more than cigarettes. Nicotine in itself is, is a poison. When you have sufficient amounts of nicotine, so quite high doses, which is quite possible to do with the products that we have today because of the way the nicotine is in the e-liquids. What Amelia is referring to is the way that modern vapes deliver 
nicotine. They use nicotine salts that are designed to be much more palatable, where in previous vapes and tobacco, you'd get symptoms like throat irritation, nausea, and a cough that would make you stop before hitting the toxic or lethal doses of nicotine. Modern vapes don't have that. So you can consume a lot more. You don't realize how much nicotine you've had. And so that means we're getting people with nicotine toxicity. And so the way that's presenting is in the form of seizures. Seizures from vaping. This is crazy. When I heard about seizures, I had to tell everyone, this is mad. This is mad. Are, they, are these in, in patients that are, are known, known to have epilepsy or are these like new seizures? No, these are people with no medical history and quite frequently they are in adolescence and youth. The data that we have is actually from people calling up uh, in the poison centres. So we have evidence of seizures in people using vapes because with cigarettes, you'd feel so unwell that you'd stop before hitting these toxic levels of nicotine. This is crazy and I didn't know this before reading Amelia's paper. And while we're talking about toxic doses, lethal doses, which are shockingly low, is another serious and new issue to me. There was a conclusive evidence about uh, poisonings. So there were instances where there was intentional poisonings, um, but there was also a fair few where there was accidental poisonings. And so those were in circumstances where the device had been left potentially unattended at home and children had then uh, consumed part of the e-liquid and um, unfortunately that has resulted in fatalities. This is very concerning, especially given that many devices use an e-liquid that is manually added to the device, leaving that potentially more accessible for children to access. But it doesn't even have to be drunk to cause poisoning. It doesn't even have to be as much as drinking. Uh, when you have an infant, uh, the amount that you need of the nicotine e-liquid uh, is almost just a uh, contact. It's actually quite a small volume that you need to have. You actually need a very small dose of nicotine for it to be fatal. The fatal dose of nicotine is about five milligrams per kilogram. So some quick maths, for a 10 kilogram toddler, that would mean only 0.5 milliliters of a 100 milligram per mil e-liquid to be a lethal dose. That's this much of a liquid that smells like bubblegum and strawberries that's widely accepted and in the pockets of many people and on the sides of their kitchens that could be and has been fatal to a toddler. It's absolutely mad. But there's something else that will result in even more deaths. We all know addiction and dependence is a bad thing. So it'd be easy for me to just skip over this point. But with vapes, there is so much more to it than I originally thought. Adolescence is a particularly critical period and um, there's an age-dependent susceptibility to nicotine. So when you're exposed at a younger age, it increases the likelihood that you are then going to go on to use nicotine and uh, be more addicted to nicotine. This is a huge deal because a big driver for smoking numbers going down was less people starting smoking in the first place. But this is changing. When we considered uh, the evidence, we combined a lot of cohort studies all together and we looked at those people who used e-cigarettes compared to those people who didn't use e-cigarettes and then whether or not after a period of time they had then initiated uh, tobacco smoking or were current smokers. And for both of those, you're three times as likely to initiate and to become a current smoker if you had been exposed to e-cigarettes. So vaping makes you three times more likely to start smoking. So the numbers are going up. But what about those that just vape? and don't start smoking. Vaping is better than smoking, right? For vapes, some evidence has said that it could be effective to help quit smoking. Although that evidence is a bit sus. And Amelia's paper on quitting smoking said it wasn't effective. And many governments are pushing vapes for this reason. So you could argue for it from a harm reduction standpoint, reducing the harm from smoking tobacco, right? Maybe not. This is something I've only grown to understand from reading the research and speaking with Amelia. And it's really changed my mindset. Let us explain. So people who think about harm reduction, uh, it's about reducing uh, the harms with the exposure. So in this case, they're talking about smoking. And that's because smoking is so incredibly harmful that the idea is we should be doing everything we can to support people who smoke to quit. It's true. 8 million people die every year from smoking related diseases. That's 22,000 people every day. 
So bearing that in mind, when you look at a population, so I'll use Australia as the example here, of the population aged 14 years and over, only 11% are current daily smokers. So when people are thinking about harm reduction, this applies only to this 11%. And can you justify widespread use of something when there's only harms that have been identified with it? Where not a single benefit has been found for the 89% of the population who are non-smokers. And then when you look even within that 11%, not everybody wants to quit. So actually, vapes are potentially only useful for a portion of that 11%. Those people who want to quit smoking using nicotine replacement devices, and that's only 1.3%. And yet it's being marketed to the other 98.7% of the population who have no use for it. Why is this message being pushed? And who is doing the pushing? This uh, idea of harm reduction is pushed by industry because of course it's in their interest to have it as a consumer good. Why would the nicotine industry want it as a widely accepted consumer product? Interesting point, Amelia asked me to declare in writing prior to the interview that I had no conflicts of interest or ties to the tobacco industry. Of course I don't, that would go against my job, but this is how careful researchers need to be. They're quite vocal, they're quite powerful, and they are the ones that are really driving this dialogue about uh, e-cigarettes. So they are muddying the waters and making this the biggest issue. Something else to bear in mind when you're considering e-cigarette research is that um, often those studies that might have some conflicts of interest um, often find more favourable outcomes that promote the idea that e-cigarettes are healthier or promote industry's agenda. A recent investigation by The Times found that tobacco firms have paid for scientific research that gives favourable outcomes like those that follow this harm reduction narrative. And these research papers have been cited as evidence in government consultation by tobacco funded campaign groups. They also found that British doctors attended pro-vaping sessions run by an NHS doctor funded by tobacco giant Philip Morris International, who make Marlboro. British American Tobacco were also found to have helped run a grassroots campaign that presented itself as the voice of ordinary vapors, which has sought to influence government policy. They even toured Europe in a vape bus, handing out merch, urging people to write to their MPs to push pro-vaping policies. And on their social media, they posted things like this. Big Tobacco posting memes that are pro-vaping behind this mask of the World Vaping Alliance. And it's not even a good meme. And this isn't the first time the tobacco industry has done this. Putting Big Tobacco aside for a moment, I mentioned that Australia has a unique approach to their vaping regulation. What is Australia's vaping strategy? Why are they doing it? And should we all be copying them? The first step in that strategy is that vapes are only available as a prescription from a doctor. So there's a couple of reasons why we decided to do that. One of the first ones was we were very concerned about the health risks and those harms for non-users, so that 89% of the population. But at the same time, if these were to help people quit, the evidence suggests that the best way to do that is in a clinical setting. So that's in conjunction with your GP. So they wanted to allow access to smokers who wanted to use it to quit smoking with the safety net of being guided by a doctor who can identify harmful effects while also restricting access to the rest of the population for which no benefit has been found. So we've now banned the importation of single use disposable vapes. Access is a really big challenge, and that will be the same for so many other countries as well, restricting access. And they're following the precautionary principle. In their study, one of the biggest findings was that there is actually no evidence, either positive or negative, about many of the health outcomes, including cancer. Gosh, okay. Uh, so, I mean, starting with the insufficient evidence, why, why is that so important? 
So for some of these outcomes, there's actually a bit of a time lag between when you have the exposure and then when you present with symptoms or, or we have that clinical disease. So something like cancer, that just takes time for that to present. E-cigarettes have not been widespread and in the market for all that long. So we can't have widespread population-based studies to give us that evidence. So in Australia, they're trying to prevent the harm rather than reacting to it once the harm has already occurred. So it changes the onus to make sure that safety has been established, particularly where there's generational consequences as well. We don't want to be trying to deal with the harms once they're already out there. Ideally, we'd be preventing this first. So if the only potential positive effect of vaping is for quitting smoking, shouldn't it be regulated in the same way and meet the same standards for safety and efficacy as other nicotine replacement therapies like patches? Shouldn't it have to go through strict drug trials to prove its efficacy and safety before being allowed to be used? Actually, uh, there has been in the UK the opportunity for e-cigarette companies to submit applications to the uh, regulatory body uh, to prove safety and efficacy and um, as far as I'm aware they've not actually received any applications uh, from industry uh, that have gone through and have been then licensed at medicines. Quick clarification here. While this is true, a medicine license was granted to the Voke device in 2014, which would have meant it could be prescribed, but it was never brought to market. British American Tobacco, who had a distribution agreement to commercialise Voke, chose not to pursue medical licensing. Their scientific director said at the time, we were never really interested in prescription products. At that time, the medicinal route was the only route to market. But smokers do not see themselves as patients. Now there are additional routes to market and we are devoting significant time and resources to extending consumer choice and delivering even better next generation tobacco and nicotine products. Oh my God, we've caught them in the act with a quote by themselves. Bloody hell. <laughs> We got them! So, there's a lack of interest by vape producers, many of which are connected to big tobacco, in testing whether their devices are safe and effective because other routes to market are more desirable. I'll let you be the judges of that. So should other governments be following Australia's example? Some are, many have outright banned vapes. And the UK government has just announced a ban on disposable vapes to try and restrict access to the younger population. And the World Health Organization has just put out an urgent call to action on vapes. Let me leave you with a final important message. I asked Amelia, how much worse are cigarettes than vapes? Tobacco is one of the worst things you can do for your health. So when you have something that's that bad, anything in comparison to that, it's going to give the appearance of being better. And so what I would put to you is that this isn't necessarily a comparison between cigarettes and e-cigarettes. There's actually this third option over here, and this is the option that's most important, and that's neither. This here is the best option for your health to not be using tobacco or nicotine in any form. And so the best thing you can do is stay away from both of those products. Australia is working with their precautionary and prescription model. The US and the UK though are pushing vapes as a method to stop smoking on quite a flimsy evidence basis. Tobacco and vaping companies are marketing them to over 98% of the population who have no need for them. Don't use tobacco and don't use vapes. And if you use vapes to quit smoking, stop the vapes as soon as you can. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. In a repeated national say, doctors in all branches of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was 